Welcome everybody to our first podcast this year. This is the Bull Meets Bear podcast sponsored by Jeffries and Bloomberg. Today we have a very special guest, Taylor, our president. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very flattered that you call me a very special guest. <laughs> you are very special. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your plans for this year? Uh, sure, that's a great question. So this year we've kind of restructured the society a little bit. So last year, you know, we had the Gosal Fund, we had McCormick Consulting, we had uh, women in finance, you know, all these different things, but we didn't really have a proper name for them. They were very much independent entities that sort of kind of operated with very little structure. So this year we've sort of overhauled the structure of that and we're now calling them initiatives. So we have the Gosal Fund Initiative, Sellside Institute Initiative, um, and McCormick Consulting Initiative. And then of course this year we've brought in the brand new Access Initiative sponsored by Jefferies, uh, focusing on increasing diversity and inclusion, not only in the society, but also in high finance itself. So they cover a range of uh, workshops and seminars dedicated to improving people's soft skills and they also raise people's awareness about diversity and inclusion internship and graduate programs so things like girls are investors 10,000 black interns seo london and uh, similar programs very very cool very cool so lewis is the biggest society on campus and we make a huge impact on our members Every single year, we've been seeing an increase in the amount of people getting internships. Why do you think Lewis is making such a big impact? That's a great question, actually. And you mentioned about being the biggest society on campus. And we, I was really pleased to say, uh, see the other day, uh, we actually smashed our record for last year's members. I don't know if oh, you wow. knew that. I yeah. do last, So last year, our peak we've already hit it and exceeded it and we're like what this is the start of week four now right that's crazy yeah so yeah. four weeks into term we've already smashed last year's uh peak of members which we hit at like march you know the end of the, around the lancaster forum time mm. so yeah we're doing really well for members this year it's been fantastic to see loads of people getting involved that weren't in years before um yeah, we do we do quite well with internships and grad schemes actually as a mm. society. It's roughly 40% of our members that go on to secure internships or grad schemes in any one year. Um and I think it it all comes down to the opportunities that we provide people. I mean the Gosal Fund is an obvious example. Um people that get involved with that fund, they work as analysts or senior analysts or even associates the sort of technical skills and the commercial awareness that they gain is unparalleled across the whole country. Mm. And this this isn't just my opinion, you know, this is something that we've heard from people in the industry. Mm. You know, we've spoken with uh, people from Jefferies, people from Media Banker, people from Bank of America, even asset management firms like uh, BlackRock and GIC you know, these firms come to us and they're really impressed with the Gosal Fund because it's it's not something that many universities offer and I think we do it in a in a fantastic way. And this year, you know, we're we're looking to expand where students can get that commercial awareness from. So last year it was very much the Gosal Fund, but this year you have the fund, you have Sellside Institute, you have the podcast. Mm. Um and, you know, even McCormick Consulting is going to be doing a lot of commercial awareness stuff this year. Mm. So yeah, we're, we're improving on what we offered last year massively. And it's that commercial awareness, it's that technical knowledge that they build up, which means when they walk into those interviews, when they when they make their applications, they are as prepared as they can be. You know, they're going in with a full arsenal that they can take and, and they're going to absolutely smash it. And people do repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, even so far this year, talking with some of the exec, I mean, we've seen people get some really prestigious... Uh, internships and grad schemes already you know we're first week of November and, and people have secured some fantastic opportunities so far yes very very good stuff to hear um, last year you were actually an associate within the Gozo investment fund yeah um, and then you're an analyst before right yeah yeah how would you think those roles compare to each other in terms of the way they prep people uh, 
Now you're just asking this because you're worried about being an associate, aren't you? <laughs> well, maybe. You're worried about the promotion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now I'm an associate as well and I'm a bit worried. But no, no. Uh, how do they prep people in different ways? Uh, what skills do they bring to the table? It's a good question. It's a good question because obviously when you're an analyst, you almost, you know nothing really. A lot of analysts, they come into the fund and they don't have any technical skills. Um, especially this year, I've had a look at the recruitment numbers and we hired more first year students than any other year. Last year, we only hired one first year student per team. So I think we hired, was it about four or five or something? It, it wasn't very many first year students mm -hmm. last year, but this year that number has increased quite a lot, more, more first year students than any other year. Um, and being an analyst is really just about learning. It's just about improving your skill sets. You learn business analysis. You learn how to uh, look at the markets in a critical way. You learn technical skills like DCF valuation. Um, but when you're an associate, that changes quite a lot. Because when you're an associate, you have the responsibility to provide that education for your analysts. But it is still a learning experience. So when you're an analyst, you're learning those technical skills. You're learning that commercial awareness but as an associate you're very much learning soft skills you're learning how to lead a team how to effectively communicate with mm. people how to delegate responsibly how to deal with um team disputes you know from from analysts in the, in your team and i think they equip you in different ways for interviews so when you go into an interview if you're an analyst and you get asked a technical question you're going to be able to answer that straight away and you're going to be able to answer that really confidently. And as an associate, it's the same, but also those competency questions where they're like, when have you overcome a challenge? When have you led a team? When have you failed at something and had to, you know, how did you deal with that failure? How did you overcome? How did you learn from that mistake? I think being an, an associate in the Gosal Fund provides some really good examples and some really good stories for those answers. Um, yeah, and it's a different kind of challenge. When I was an analyst in my first year, I was in the energy fund, uh, or the energy team rather, and th this was all online. So yeah, the emphasis really was on, well, how well can you contribute to the pitch? But then when I was an associate last year, leading the media and telecoms team, um, it became much more, how can you organize your team meetings? How can you mobilize your analysts? How can you help them to grow? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a different kind of challenge. It's really, really good how we've opened up positions to a lot more first years than before, because at the end of the day, like you mentioned, the Gosal Fund is for members to learn. It's for everybody to add value to each other and grow as a unit together. And, you know, it's great that we have these uh, opportunities available. Mm. What do you think are the biggest challenges that you faced as an associate that you didn't really expect before? It's a good question. Um, I think the biggest challenge was definitely managing my time effectively. It's, yeah, I don't think people really appreciate how much effort it takes to be an associate because it's a lot of work because you do just as much work as everybody else does in your team. You know, you're, if you have, if each of you and your analysts divide your PowerPoint so every person takes two slides or three slides or a specific area of your presentation, which is what happened last year with all the teams. You take one area as well as all the analysts. So you contribute to that slides, to the PowerPoint, as much as all the others do. But then on top of that, you have all these additional responsibilities. You have to teach people how to do business analysis, how to do DCF valuation. And... Yeah, it, it's all those added responsibilities that take up a lot, a lot of time. And obviously last year I was also involved in the exec. I was training for volunteer positions. I was founding another society. So yeah, the, I think the biggest challenge for me was managing all those responsibilities and making sure that I was uh, doing my position justice, um, which is something that I struggled with, with at first. But I, I think in the end... Um, I managed to kind of learn from the experience and put in place 
several different techniques to help me do that. And and I like to think that I managed to overcome that challenge in the end, but I suppose you'd have to ask my analysts on whether I did a good job or not. Well, I mean, now you are the president of the society and that's an even bigger role with more responsibilities <laughs> and you seem to be coping fine. Well, I you think, think that's helped, you know, having yes. experience as an associate. Yeah, yeah I, I think it helps in not just in being president of the society, but in a whole number of ways, I think it helps. Um, I, I think it helped when I had my internship with Knight Frank. I think it helped when I was studying for my exams. And yeah, I think it helps now. But I, I like to think that I do a pretty good job of delegating responsibility as president. So it's not, you know, I know that last year there were one or two people in the exec who very much did 90%, 95% of the work. And I, I think as a team, we're much more collectively responsible now. And I think that normal exec members get a lot more involved in the running of things and have more responsibility themselves than they might have done last year. For example, uh, last night we ran the Access uh, networking event. And this was organized and run by Vessi, who's our head of access, and uh, Daniel Hampshire, who's a, an events exec. And, you know, they organized the whole thing. They ran the whole thing. I was there for the first 10 minutes and then I, I was able to leave them because I've, you know, I, I trust them to run a good event and I trust them to handle that level of responsibility. So it is a lot, but I like to think that I'm focusing on the big picture stuff. Like, where do we want to take the society this year? in terms of our general strategy, in terms of our corporate sponsors, in terms of our outlook for the next few years, rather than you know doing the day-to-day -day events planning. So we talked a lot about our society. Let's talk a little bit about the news. Okay. The UK markets have been going crazy. There's the mini budget. Um, it seems like they just completely scrapped the handbook, threw it out the window and just did whatever they wanted to do, which spooked investors. The pound dropped, gilts market, you know, went haywire, um, yields just rose so quickly and the prices dropped. Yeah. Um, pension funds needed collateral, so there was a, a spiral sell-off. What's your take on the whole situation? Where do you think it's heading? Well, I think you summed it up very well. Um, the thing that investors rely on is stability and credibility. That mini budget just, you know, ripped that up for the markets. Uh, I think going forward, we're definitely going to see rising interest rates from the Bank of England, especially while inflation stays as high as it is right now. Um, I think last week we hit 10%. Um, and when those interest rates continue to rise, it's going to make the UK less and less of a fantastic investment opportunity. Specifically, if we look within the real estate sector, um, every time those interest rates go up, it's going to hit those investors, which are very highly leveraged, uh, specifically in areas like industrials, so distribution centers, warehouses, factories. Those investors have a lot of debt that they took out to buy those properties. When this interest rate comes up, those investors are not going to be able to pay the interest on that debt and those property values are going to fall when we see them trying to sell them really quickly. It really is a difficult situation because we got raging inflation and when we rise our interest rates, we're going to stifle growth and UK growth is not particularly too good at the <laughs> moment. It's a careful balancing act between the two. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting conflict between fiscal and monetary policy. Fiscal policy, especially under Liz Truss, was to uh, try and increase growth as much as possible. But the Bank of England obviously has to meet its inflation target of, I think it's 2% two, 2 or 2.5%. And so wh what we saw with the mini budget is they were trying to pump money into growth initiatives, decreasing corporation taxes, decreasing taxes on the rich to incentivize people to work more or be more productive. Um, but in the end, that's going to cause inflation to go up even further, which means the Bank of England has to raise interest rates even further, which, again, um, is going to stifle growth. So, yeah, it's about finding that delicate balance not to go too far in one direction that you start to kind of force the Bank of England's hand, but also not to be so uh, not to have such reductionary fiscal policy that the uh, there is no growth at all. Mm. It seems like we haven't actually progressed at all as an economy. The U turn on the key things that they proposed uh, when Liz Truss was rising to power, and then everything is just back to normal. Well, normal in quotation marks because yeah. they had to do loads of bond buybacks, sending loads and loads more money into the economy, 
yeah. fueling inflation further. It really is a tough situation. It's a very um, expensive U-turn. Yeah. Let's talk about also the Twitter and Elon Musk shenanigan. <laughs> uh, crazy, crazy ordeal. Yeah, that's one um, way of putting it. Hard to, hard to actually predict where anything's going to go. Yeah. And with such volatility, you know, it's not always good for the financial markets. People want predictability. What's your take on that situation? Yeah, as you say, it is interesting and it is hard to predict where it's going to go. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about where Elon's going to take the platform. Um, and he himself has said a couple of things. So, you know, he's suggesting that it's going to be um, sort of like a, a citizen's forum almost, you know, with very little infringement on free speech. He wants to kind of open it up as much as possible. And people have been speculating about what that means. The platform has seen rising levels of hate speech since that announcement, um, but also in ways that he's going to monetize the platform more to try and recoup on his very large investment. Um, so he's been saying that he's going to charge users to have the blue verified tick and like he's going to $8 a month. Yeah. $8 a month. Yeah. He's going to open that up to people, but is that going to reduce the credibility of the platform? A lot of people turn to Twitter because they want to hear the views of those verified people. They're often celebrities or politicians or important business people. And if you open that blue tick up to everyone, that might reduce the draw of the platform somewhat. Yes, of course. Um, when it comes to Twitter, I'm not overly knowledgeable about the platform because I don't <laughs> use it myself. Um, how does it compare to other social media platforms? And why do you think Elon even initially proposed to buy it? Well, he tried to back out of it and then mm. there was some sort of lawsuit threat uh, towards him, which prompted him to complete the purchase. But what do you think drew him to Twitter in the first place? It's a good question. Um, Twitter is a very unique platform. People don't really use Twitter to keep up with friends or keep up with families. For those sorts of things, they turn to Facebook or they turn to Instagram. Um, Twitter is almost a platform where celebrities, politicians can broadcast to their audience. People use Twitter to keep up to date with um, with those celebrities, with those politicians. That's why you see it quoted so much in the news. You know, you turn to BBC or Sky News and they will often have pictures of tweets and it's because announcements are made on that platform. Um, and I think there's a bit of a disconnect there between what Elon wants the platform to be and what the platform actually is. I think Elon is going to try and take it into a bit more of a... Um, of a discussion platform. He's going to try and uh, encourage people to use it as their main social media platform rather than the sort of announcement, the sort of keeping up to date with celebrities, which is what people currently use it for. Um, I think it's a terrible um, kind of mess what happened with the acquisition. I don't think he ever really wanted to buy it. I think he kind of backed himself into a corner by saying that he would and then obviously his hand got forced um we, and i think that's evident by the fact that no due diligence was done on the platform before he took over yeah there was some speculation that a lot of the accounts were actually bot accounts um which are inactive they're not real people uh which reduces the, the attractiveness of the platform isn't it to, to yeah. a potential buyer I see, I see. And I think people are suggesting that the actual value of Twitter is significantly below what he paid for it mm. because so many of those users were, were bot accounts, as you say. Mm. Huge premium, right? Yeah. 44 huge. billion. Yeah. For that it's a deal. crazy investment. Mm. I've seen people suggesting it's only really worth 10 billion, mm. which, you know, paying 400% what you should be. It's quite a lot. And it's having an impact on Tesla's own stock price, um, Elon Musk is the head of Tesla. And with all this volatility, uh, it's scaring people away from Tesla's stock. Yeah. Well, because, you know, he backed up so much of his investment with um, his stock in Tesla. And this was actually something back when he first announced the acquisition, there was worry that he wasn't going to be financially able to complete it because as soon as he came out um, with his intentions and, and showed how much was going to be financed by selling off Tesla stock, the price actually went down a lot and there was a, a price that if the Tesla stock hit, he was going to have to fork out a lot of his own money to do it. 
And yeah, it's making people wary about investing in Tesla. I think he's one of those people that's a bit, um, he's a bit unpredictable, sort of like Kanye West. <laughs> uh, you know, yes. it's, he does some random wacky stuff sometimes and yeah it makes people a bit nervous about investing in good his for businesses. entertainment great for and it's been fantastic <laughs> watching it all unfold but yeah not good to be a, a an asset manager mm. and that concludes our first podcast thank you taylor for coming on to the show it was great having you here if you guys have any suggestions for what we should cover next please suggest it to us thank you and see you next time